In this video lecture, I am going to talk about the uses of sulfonamide derivatives in the management of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, a group of chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So, characteristic feature is chronic inflammation and it typically involves the large intestine. The symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease are lower abdominal pain, chronic diarrhea, blood in stool, bloating, unexpected weight loss and fatigue. So what are the signs of involvement in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? In Crohn's disease, any part of the bowel can be involved from the mouth to the anus, but it typically involves the terminal ileum and the colon. So the colon is segmental areas or patchy areas of colon are affected in Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, the inflammation starts in the rectum and continues into the colon. So this is continuous involvement of the colon and the rectum. So the common sites of involvement in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is terminal ileum, colon, rectum or the distal GI tract is affected in inflammatory bowel disease. So to understand drug therapy in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, it is important to know the physiopathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. The figure here shows intact intestinal epithelial layer. So the intestinal epithelial layer remains intact and this is due to the presence of healthy gut microbiota, the beneficial microbes such as lactobacillus which helps to maintain the epithelial layer of the intestine and prevents the bacteria and toxins from entering into the deeper tissues and prevents inflammation. But there are certain factors that trigger that cause damage to the epithelial layer and these factors include environment, diet, chronic bacterial infections, certain antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that causes disruption of the epithelial layer. So the epithelial layer is damaged, there is increased permeability to the bacterial antigens and toxins which crosses the epithelial layer and reaches the lamina propria which lies beneath the epithelial layer. Now once it reaches the lamina propria, it interacts with the macrophages and the dendritic cells. So the dendritic cells and macrophages which are the innate cells are activated and this triggers an abnormal immune response. So the immune response becomes active and these innate cells, the macrophages and dendritic cells with an aim to clear the bacterial antigens releases pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-2. So a host of inflammatory cytokines are released by the macrophages, by the dendritic cells and this leads to chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation occurs as a result of abnormal immune response. This type of immune response is also known as innate immune response. So innate immune response and where the macrophages and the dendritic cells participate in innate immune response. The release of these inflammatory cytokines also stimulates the T helper cells the Th2 cells which play a crucial role in acquired immunity also known as adaptive immunity. So the T helper cells play an important role in immune regulation. So the T helper 2 cells become overactive and there is dysregulation of the immune response. This causes more aggressive inflammation involving the deeper tissues. So the abnormal immune response includes the innate response and acquired or adaptive response. Also there is an autoimmune component that is involved in inflammatory bowel disease. Some of the bacterial antigens are expressed as self antigens in the gut and because of the resemblance with the antigens of the gut cells, the immune system mistakenly attacks the gut cells of the intestine, the healthy normal intestinal cells are attacked and this can contribute to further inflammation. Now this is more pronounced in individuals who are more predisposed to inflammatory bowel disease because the genes associated with inflammatory bowel disease are associated, are responsible for immune regulation and bacterial recognition. So with the disruption of the intestine, there 
is an abnormal immune response and this abnormal immune response includes the innate immune response, the adaptive immune response and the autoimmune response. So these immune responses can aggravate chronic inflammation, can contribute further to inflammation. Next is the generation of free radicals. The reactive oxygen species are produced in excessive quantities and this is because of the harmful bacteria and the immune responses that causes excessive production of reactive oxygen species. The free radical formation increases and simultaneously the antioxidant defense mechanism decreases. So this reduces the ability of the body to neutralize the reactive oxygen species. Lastly, there is also involvement of nuclear factor kappa beta. So nuclear factor kappa beta which is a transcription factor or protein complex that is responsible for the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha and the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines exacerbates the chronic inflammatory process. So now that we have learned about the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease, let's now move on to the drug therapy of inflammatory bowel disease. So the first line treatment for the management of mild to moderate ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is 5 amino salicylic acid also known as mesalamine. So it is the first line treatment for the management of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So what are the pharmacological effects of 5 amino salicylic acid and how is it useful in ulcerative colitis? So 5 amino salicylic acid produces various anti-inflammatory effects and these anti-inflammatory effects are produced due to the inhibition of cyclooxygenase enzyme and lipoxygenase enzyme responsible for the production of prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So 5 amino salicylic acid by blocking the arachidonic acid pathway by blocking enzymes such as cyclooxygenase enzyme, lipoxygenase enzyme decreases the production of inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins, leukotrienes, various cytokines and this plays a very important role in its anti-inflammatory action. The second mechanism is it down regulates the nuclear factor kappa beta. The nuclear factor kappa beta is down regulated. This is the transcription factor. This is the protein complex that is responsible for the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. By down regulating, by decreasing the activation of nuclear factor kappa beta, it inhibits inflammation, it produces anti-inflammatory action. Thirdly, it acts as an antioxidant. So it decreases the generation of reactive oxygen species, the free radical formation decreases and the antioxidant defense mechanism increases. So the defense mechanism increases and the free radical formation decreases. In this way it produces its antioxidant action and protects the epithelial layer from the bacterial toxins, from the oxidative free radicals and inhibits damage to the intestine, protecting the intestinal layer and reducing the symptoms. Also it has direct action on the epithelial cells of the intestine it promotes healing of the intestinal layer and reduces damage to the intestinal layer and this helps in reducing the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease so 5 amino salicylic acid exerts anti-inflammatory action antioxidant action promotes epithelial healing and this helps to induce and maintain remission in inflammatory bowel disease so it helps to reduce the symptoms reduce the progression of the disease, thereby reducing the complications such as toxic megacolon or intestinal perforation and this helps to improve the quality of life of the patient and is beneficial in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So 5 amino salicylic acid produces several clinical benefits but the major drawback is that it is absorbed in the upper GI tract. So because it is absorbed in the upper GI tract, very less concentration reaches the terminal ileum and colon. 
And as we have learned that the terminal ileum, colon, rectum are the sites of active inflammation and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And it requires high concentration of 5 amino salicylic acid to produce a desirable therapeutic effect. So high concentration of the drug is required in the distal GI tract to produce a desirable therapeutic effect. And because 5 amino salicylic acid in unformulated form is absorbed in the upper GI tract, leading to less drug reaching the distal GI tract, the terminal area. So this leads to inadequate treatment or therapeutic failure. Orally administered sulfur salazine in unformulated form undergoes absorption in the upper GI tract before reaching the terminal ileum and colon, thus decreasing the concentration at sites of active inflammation. So, to overcome this drawback, precursors of 5 amino salicylic acid are developed, and one such precursor is sulfur salazine. Now, sulfur salazine is composed of, it consists of 5 amino salicylic acid, which is the active drug, which is the therapeutic moiety. And this is linked to sulfur pyridine by the presence of azo bond. So the azo bond connects the active drug that is 5 amino salicylic acid to sulfur pyridine. Now the presence of azo bond prevents the liberation of 5 amino salicylic acid in the upper intestine. So 5 amino salicylic acid remains bound to sulfur pyridine by the help of an azo bond. And it passes through the upper GI tract, reaches the terminal ileum, colon, and when it encounters the colonic bacteria, the bacteria causes release of enzymes that causes degradation of this molecule, releasing the active drug that is 5 amino salicylic acid is released in the colon because of the presence of colonic bacteria. Now, if you look at the side effects of sulfur salicine, 30% of the patients experience headache and GI side effects such as nausea, vomiting, anorexia. And this is due to the sulfur pyridine component of sulfur salicine. So, sulfur pyridine component is responsible for majority of the side effects of sulfur salicine. Also, because it is a sulfonamide derivative, it can cause hypersensitivity reactions such as rash, fever, hepatitis, pneumonitis, pancreatitis in very rare cases. Because most of the side effects are related to the sulfur pyridine component, osalazine has been developed and here the sulfur pyridine component has been replaced by another 5 amino salicylic acid. So sulfur pyridine which is responsible for most of the adverse effects is removed by 5 amino salicylic acid which is linked to another 5 amino salicylic acid both being the active component in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Now the third derivative is balsalazide. In balsalazide 5 amino salicylic acid is linked to an inactive metabolite. So here the sulfur pyridine is replaced by an inactive metabolite to eliminate, to reduce the side effects of sulfur pyridine. Next is there is a variety of mesalamide formulations that release 5 amino salicylic acid at sites of active inflammation in the distal GI tract in inflammatory bowel disease. So one such preparation is delayed release capsule that is also known as pentasa. So this contains time release microgranules which releases the active drug throughout the intestine, the ileum, colon and this is helpful in releasing the active drug throughout the intestine slowly, gradually in a time dependent manner. This is particularly useful in cases of extensive colitis where the entire GI tract is affected and the active drug has to reach all sites of the inflammation. The second preparation is a pH sensitive resin that is the active drug is coated with a resin which dissolves in the terminal ileum and colon at pH 7. So at pH 7 the coating dissolves releasing the active drug 5 amino salicylic acid in the terminal ileum and colon and this helps in reducing the inflammation and is useful in the management of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. 
Also, there are other preparations such as enema, supposed piece that delivers high concentration of drug to the rectum. This is particularly useful in ulcerative colitis where rectum is predominantly involved. So, there are a variety of mesalamine formulations that helps in targeted delivery of the drug based on the location, based on the severity of the disease. So, in case of extensive colitis where the entire GI tract is involved, a delayed release capsule would be useful. Where the rectum is involved, enema or suppositories which deliver high concentration of the drug can be used. And also a pH sensitive resin coating can be used to deliver the drug to the sites of active inflammation that is terminal ileum and colon. The advantages of newer generations of sulfonamide derivatives, the mesalamine formulations are targeted delivery to the intestine, improved tolerability, reduced systemic side effects and this helps to improve the quality of life of the patient by reducing the symptoms complication, the progression of the disease. So with this we come to the end of this topic. If you find my video useful, please like and subscribe to this channel.